WTTV has always been Indiana's sports station, a reputation we proudly continue with our coverage of Indiana and Purdue basketball, as well as the Indianapolis Colts, Indiana Pacers, and Big Ten football. Sarkis Tarzian knew from the beginning that sports would be a mainstay at WTTV. The first basketball game televised on WTTV was between University High School and Ellettsville High School on November 22, 1949. They ran cables to the school across the street from the station. We opened up the windows and shot the camera out the window and that was it. We had one camera, one view, and that was it. And the announcer was sitting on the chair watching the game from his own room. <laughs> Big thrill. It was not long after that when broadcasting Indiana University games seemed like a good idea. We were so desperate for something to put on the air that we thought, gee, uh, uh, why don't we do high school basketball? Uh, and we did Bloomington High School, University School, uh, Ellettsville, anybody. And then it occurred to us to go talk to Pooch Harrell, who is the assistant athletic director at IU, about putting on basketball games. And we had just gotten the technology. The station only had two cameras total. So we, we had one under the basket and one up in the booth. And there was a race after the game to tear him down, get him back to the studio so we could do the 11 o'clock news. We couldn't make the 10 o'clock news, it was it just wouldn't work. But um, it was interesting, the university, uh, Pooch Harrell said to me, uh, if we televise games, uh, who's going to come and see them? Uh, we didn't have a very good answer for that, but, he, but we did say, well, we'll pay you for the empty seats. But we didn't know how many empty seats, so we decided maybe 750. So we gave them $750 per game with the promise that if the seats sold out that we wouldn't have to do that. Well, the seats did sell out, but they didn't give the money back. <laughs> In fact, they wanted more money and more money. Um, justifiably so, I might say, because they were, they really made, uh, Channel 10 was our uh, frequency in those days. We didn't go to Channel 4 until about, I'd say, 53, 54, and we swapped with a Terre Haute station uh, to get that. And the reason why we wanted it is because the lower channels on uh, VHS will cover a greater distance. You could get out about 70 miles. The higher channels, the uh, coverage area would shrink. So we moved our transmitter to Cloverdale first to try to get an Indianapolis audience, and it didn't work. Uh, and then uh, to um, Trafalgar with a thousand foot tower, where it still is today, I understand. That worked much better. And then when cable came along, it solved all those coverage problems. But in the early days of basketball, uh, in black and white, with uh, uh, we had to sell the game, sell the advertising, and there was a, an advertising agency in Indianapolis named Reuben, and the Reuben agency represented Chesty Foods. They bought the entire game. So every commercial was a Chesty commercial, and we did them live with a big box of potato chips at our feet, and we just turned to the camera. Our opening remark was quite ad-lib and quite spontaneous. I turned to the camera and held a bag of potato chips up and said, I've got my ticket, have you got yours? And uh, that set off a, a firestorm of buying of Chesty Foods. Uh, the good old people of Indiana, they are honest as the day is long, and if you put a, a burden like that on them, they respond. The chip manufacturer, George Johnson, was head of the company. They had to back trucks up into supermarket parking lots filled with potato chip bags and sell them off the back of the trucks to keep up with the demand. It was that great. Uh, you got to remember that only was television new, but uh, Indiana made a run at the Big Ten Championship at the same time, and uh, in 1953 not only won the Big Ten Championship, but the National Championship uh, in NCAA. And Branch McCracken was the coach, the big sheriff, great guy, and uh, everybody forgets old Branch uh, since Bobby Knight's been there, but uh, he was one of the great legends. Now you must remember we had two studio cameras in order to televise the Indiana University basketball games, here's what we did. We had the early news with Ed Keith. This ran 5.30 to 6. Then we would have the network news, John Cameron Swayze in the news from 6 to 6.15, Coke time with Eddie Fisher. Okay, we were in network then. As soon as the local news was over, we had to turn the cameras off, take them off, put them in a truck, 
go to Indiana University, haul them up the stairs, get them hooked up, and be ready for tip-off at 745. As soon as that was done, then we would have to dismantle the cameras, take them back downstairs, put them in a truck, go back to the studio, believe it or not, put them back together and have them ready to do a 10 o'clock news. We did not have a remote truck. Now we did have microwave. So back in the days of, of early 50s, television was very challenging because we had to figure ways that we were able to accomplish the impossible. Paul Lennon called the original plays, Bob Cook and Herb Isaacs would later take on the task which included the familiar courtside chesty pitch. In the basketball games that Herb Isaacs was the play-by-play -play commentator, we used to do chesty potato chip commercials live and what happened during the game, and when it was a timeout, the camera would turn around to, uh, to Herb, who would then stand there and hold up a bag of chesty potato chips and do a, do a live commercial, and we might have a, a shot on the other camera of a bowl of chesty potato chips. Tom Bowyard is fouled as he turns around. Robluski charged with the personal, and a timeout is called on the floor with the Wildcats leading 15 to 9. Well, when there's timeout at your house, we hope it's time in for Chesty Ruffles. You know, Chesty Ruffles are truly the special chip that's perfect for dipping. That's because Chesty Ruffles are lattice cut. And they're rippled to make them stronger. That means that when you're dipping, they hold up. But you know, when you serve chesty ruffles, the one thing you will observe is that the guests will certainly congregate around the bowl. You don't really need a party, though, to serve chesty ruffles. No, sir. You can enjoy chesty ruffles just when you're relaxing at home. When you're watching a basketball game, it's a good time to enjoy chesty ruffles. As a matter of fact, I hope you're watching them right now. Chesty ruffles made by the crisp perfection process. Chesty Ruffles and other chesty food, it's fun to eat. And Paul Lennon and I uh, kind of pioneered the thing in the sense that people didn't, probably didn't know how bad we were. I mean, you know, one of the interesting things we did on television, and, and, and Branch McCracken before he died, we talked about that one day, he took me aside and he said, the rebound, you see basketball used to be 10 to 12 and 15 to 16 and all that, so now it's 110. And the rebound is, is so important. And on the charts that we, uh, Channel 4 did, and we'd show the charts, the number of rebounds. We kept the rebounds. In those days, newspaper men didn't pay attention to the rebounds. They didn't think it was very important. But Branch said, he said, I think you ought to pay more attention to rebounds because he said, scores are gonna get bigger and bigger and um, a 5-5 a, a five, five player by pop, proper, properly positioning himself can be a good rebounder too. And nowadays, rebounds are very important. As you know, if you're reading the account of the basketball game, that's the first thing they tell you is how many points you got and how many rebounds you got. Coaches' shows have always been popular on WTTV, but the longest running and most watched coach in Indiana is, of course, Bob Knight. My first meeting with Coach Knight was at the Athletic Club after Indiana University and Bill Orwig had announced that uh, Lou Watson had resigned and, and they had sought a new coach and they'd found him. And they brought him in from Army this one day and then of course he'd been signed. And um, his reaction to me there in the athletic club was basically the same reaction as now. He was uh, and, and I don't mean this to cast a bad light on, on Bob. He, he was cautious, and to this day he still is. You have to be very careful how you say something to coach, because he takes everything literally. It, it all has to be placed properly for him to understand it the way you, you intend it. And, um, I can remember we had an experience one time, first year, Indiana went to Ohio University to play at Athens, and uh, by all credits, we should have beaten them. We had Steve Downing and John Ritter and, and uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of other boys that, that had, uh, had established themselves. And at any rate, uh, we weren't in the game. We lost the game. And, uh, 
uh, one of the players was outside. We were waiting on the ramp outside, and one of the players said, uh, said good evening to me after the game was over, and I asked him, I said, you know, I said, you looked like you were open several times tonight. I, I, why didn't you shoot? You know, just a simple question, academic. And I wasn't, you know, prodding him or prying or anything. And he looked at me very polite, and he said, well, Mr. Marlowe, he said, uh, maybe the coach didn't want me to shoot. And I said, fine. Then, you know, that's great. Answer the question. So we got back home, and uh, next day at about noon, I was paged, and uh, it was Coach Knight. And all he said at that time was, you do the broadcasting and I'll do the coaching. And hung up on him right now. So at that time, he came up here to do the shows. So on a Thursday night, never forget it, he walked in the front door. Are we ready? And I said, yes, they're just about ready, but I want to talk to you first. And I took him back in the back room and we just cleared the air. And he understood what I meant, and then I understood why he didn't want me doing what I did, and uh, it's been great ever since. Now, you know, we've had highs and lows. I mean, uh, jestingly, he teases me a lot, but on the other hand, once in a while, uh, he, he, you know, gets pretty intense. And, um, but he knows I know that. And he knows that I understand why he's that way. And uh, whatever patience I'm able to show, uh, he, he relies on the fact that I do have that. And we've had a relationship for 29 years, and I hope for a few more.